Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Julie and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293 CX 106.5. So thank, uh, thankful that you've joined us on this Saturday morning to talk a little bit of gardening. So let's go to the IVOrganics.com 3 one Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Yeah, we have uh, Michael Carolyn. He's an Associate Dean for Research for the College of Liberal Arts at Colorado State University. He is the author of this book, No One Eats Alone Food as a Social Enterprise, where he identifies the crucial missing missing ingredient from our current food movements, the human connection. Welcome to the program, Michael. Hi, Holly. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, you're very very welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to speak with Holly, myself, and our listeners about your book and the imp- and the and interesting uh, things that you found out by writing this book. Now, in today's world, people are constantly eating alone, whether at their desk or in their car or wherever. So why do you claim that no one eats alone? Well, I guess there's two reasons for that. One is to, to in part, evoke that very question, because what I, what I try to, I'm sorry, I, I have some, there's some feedback in the back that it's hard to, to hear what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's better. So what I try to do in the book is I interviewed a lot of people from Fortune 500 companies to talk with them about the ways in which they're able to shape our our attitudes and tastes towards food. And the reason why I did that is to highlight for folks that are involved in the alternative food movement that there are other elements that they need to think more about when it comes to shaping the taste and desires around food. Um, now, what, what that means, I'll just give, give one example. Um, perhaps the most famous comes from actually Coca-Cola, who's been at the forefront of this. And this is the idea that if you can make food convivial, that people tend to associate with those foods and those practices in a much more positive way. And, and what I mean by that is Coke has had what is known as the ubiquitous strategy. And this is the idea of making sure that people have a Coke in their hands every time they're having a good time, every time that you're experiencing a pleasurable moment. And so this began the long love affair between what used to be at least their national pastime ba- baseball and, the, and, and Coca-Cola. The thinking being that if you can at least get a Coke in the hands of a child with their, when they're having a good time at a baseball game, then they'll be able, begin to associate positive sediments with this product. And then from that, Coca-Cola began to be uh, at at fairs and parks. And, of course, more recently, McDonald's does this with Playland. And this is just simply the idea that when people are having a good time, um, there's a whole other positive economic benefits that come from that, from 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 a business standpoint, from a food corporation standpoint. And so looking at ways in which some of these alternative food movements are, are trying to make their food social, make their food convivial, and then trying to extract from that um, ways in which we can talk about additional value that's created in these spaces, these local food movements, urban gardens, farmers markets, etc., cetera, um, that go beyond just creating jobs and generating revenue for the community, but also talk about concrete ways in which it's improving the social environment. And that's really what I try to do in this book. Fantastic. Now, you, you prefer the term foodscape. To, uh, as opposed to the word food system, and you argue that we need to shift from a society of food consumers to a food citizen. What are the differences between these terms, and how would, if we use, if we changed our language, how would that, um, what power does that language have to make us think about our relationship with food? Yeah. Um, so what I what's increasingly being used is the term food system. And when I interact with people from the USDA and policymakers and even practitioners, um, th- this idea of food system often gets reduced to what I would call a value chain, that food is nothing more than involves farmers, retailers, processors, um, and, and consumers. And as we, we just know anecdotally, food is more complex than that. The social life of food goes beyond just that value chain. And another piece to that is when we reduce ourselves just to consumers, we really reduce our imaginary when it comes to thinking about how we can create social change in our food system or in our foodscape. Because if we're just consumers, then the only way we can really change the foodscape or the food system is by making the right, quote-unquote, decisions upon what to buy. 
And I really want to push through this book, too, to show, by so, showing examples that, you know, you, you have to become also political if you want to think about social change in the context of food. Think beyond just buying the right things and also thinking about how you can get involved socially and civically and politically to make that change happen. And and one really interesting point to kind of illustrate this about the power of, of some of these spaces is that I, I talk about in one instance where I did a longitudinal study looking at um, alternative food networks here along the Front Range in Colorado. And I interviewed people right when they were beginning to be involved in these spaces. And then I also interviewed them two years later after they had two years of, if you will, exposure to these practices and these people and this, and this food. And what was interesting is that when I talked to them the first time and I asked them why were they were involved in these spaces and why they bought this food, they overwhelmingly talked about things like, well, they thought the food tasted better or they thought it was healthier. And this actually re replicates a lot of findings about why people tend to buy this sort of food because they think it tastes better and is healthier. But what was interesting is when I talked to them again two years later, they still thought the food tasted great and was healthy, but their main priority had changed. Now their main priority for continuing to be involved in these spaces was because of the social connections they made. So they talked about things like wanting to support the community, wanting to support local growers, wanting to support systems that are sustainable, and, and, creating, and supporting systems that give their workers things like a livable wage. So there was a social justice element to that. And that's interesting to me because it shows that these experiences actually seem to ha play some sort of role in, in changing people's attitudes toward these particular foods from thinking that it was only about taste and health to actually showing that the convivialness, if you will, of some of these experiences actually made them think about food in, in ways that went beyond what was good for me and what was good to my family to having kind of a more we orientation, a community orientation, a more civic orientation. And, and so that was a, that's an important finding to just try to show what I mean by these spaces, these experiences, creating value that go beyond just j job growth and revenue generation for a community. Very interesting. Uh, what are two actions somebody can take to become a better food citizen? After that, where can we look for more guidance in that, in that field? Right. Two actions to become a better food citizen. Well, uh, setting aside going to support and buy the right things, to talk about things like citizenship, I, would, I do encourage my students to get involved, to, to, to figure out what you're passionate about when it comes to food, and just get involved socially and politically with those things. Make those connections. And also, we don't think about this in the context of food very much, but, I, but as I talk about a lot in my book, it's really important to find spaces where you're able to interact with um, people that look and think differently from yourself. And, and of course, we could spend hours talking about the, the, the social and political divisions that exist in our society. But what I was also hopeful about this book is that some of these alternative food networks, by way of creating inviting spaces where people, black and white, uh, different, who pray to different gods, are able to come together over food, over a dinner table, in a garden, while weeding, have conversations, and, and realize and, and generate empathy toward people that are different from themselves. And so I would also encourage people just to find opportunities to interact with people um, that are, are, are not just like themselves. And some of these food spaces create really wonderful opportunities for that, which, which have fairly significant social implications. Well, and, and you bring up a point, no matter who you are or who you're around, the, the basis is food brings us together. We have a common, common core there. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what makes this whole conversation around food so interesting to me, because unlike some topics, food is something, <clears throat> excuse me, is something we all know intimately. It's something that we literally put into ourselves multiple times a day, and so to some degree, in some ways, we're all sort of experts about food, which makes it an interesting topic for conversation, but also an an important and potentially important platform for creating ways in which we can interact with people in, in new ways. Now, with your book, no, no One Eats Alone, what do you hope the reader takes away from it? I mean, as, as authors, we've had a number of authors on the program, and they all have a, an initial vision when they start writing the book. What did you, you hope and what do you hope our listeners and, and your readers of this book take away when they, they, they consume it? Right. 
I hope that readers will take away from the book an, an image of food that goes beyond what I sometimes describe as a very reductionist understanding of food, where we think about food purely in terms of its retail cost or purely in terms of what the nutrition facts say on the label, and, and just think about it in a more broad, systematic type of way. Um, I, I give one example in a book that's really interesting where I interviewed a gentleman from China who is a manager of an industrial vitamin D plant. And he talked about kind of jokingly how his plant is used to generate health in countries like the United States because a lot of his vitamin D goes to fortifying much of the foods that, that exist in our foodscape today. If you look, most of our foods are in fact fortified with, with vitamins. These are all industrial, industrialized produced vitamins. And they're produced in ways that are not terribly sustainable, that are not very healthy. He was joking about how his plant spoils the environment and, 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 and is harmful to the surrounding communities. Um, and yet it's, a, it's part of a system that is supposed to be creating a healthy body in the United States while simultaneously soiling healthy communities in other parts of the world. So I just want people to think about food in more complex ways, which I think will inform them not only as consumers, but also as food citizens. Well, fantastic. Thank you. And could you just tell us, again, the name of your book, where to find it, and where to find out more about your um, about you? Sure. The title of the book is No One Eats Alone, Food as a Social Enterprise. Uh, my name is Michael Carolyn. As you said, I'm a professor of sociology at Colorado State University. And uh, you can find my book online at islandpress.com or at um, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or at hopefully at some of your local bookstores. And if you want to learn more, you can look at my website, michaelcarolyn.com, um, and that should tell you everything you need to know about me and my, my background. Well, Michael, we appreciate you very much taking time out of your day to join Holly, myself, and all of our listeners to tell us more about your book and the mission behind it. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. If you're in the Milwaukee or surrounding areas, just tune your radio to 860 AM or FM 106.5. You can also find links on our Facebook pages, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and Home Canning. Our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, click on the radio tab at the top of the page, then click on the Listen Live button, and you'll have immediately access to our live program. Mobile devices work very well also. Go to your app store and download for free the TuneIn app or the simple radio app. Then search WNOV 860, save it to your favorites, and you can have access to our radio show live wherever you're at in the world. Our radio program will also have podcast replay under the radio tab day, uh, several days following the live broadcast. You can find all of these links in the show notes below. Our show airs 9 to 10 a.m. Central Standard Time every Saturday, March through the end of October. And we want to thank our sponsors because without them, this would not be anywhere possible. You can find all of their links under the radio tab on our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.